moving rapidly along, straight along, we've now got our second panel discussion of the day. Uh, and more of the same. We're going to be discussing a lot more about those sustainability issues. And in fact, um, the title of the panel, surprise, surprise, Sustainability, the Future of Sourcing, uh, gives me great pleasure to welcome our moderator for this panel, Alistair Monument. Um, he is Scottish, which means that he's nearly French. <laughs> okay. FSC Asia Pacific Regional Director, Forest Stewardship Council. Um, interesting enough, Alistair um, has been working in China driving um, the FSC um, theme and, and, and really trying to drive home to a lot of those corporates um, about the importance of FSC um, over the last few years. Um, early last year, at the beginning of 2011, he set up the regional offices here in Hong Kong. But in fact, he, he's been in China since, I think, 2006, uh, working in Qingdao, and not just drinking beer, but really <laughs> helping to drive home a lot of those messages around the FSC. Alistair, I'll hand it over to you, and you can introduce your esteemed panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we have a great panel. Um, covering a whole range of issues, and we're going to from the production side, from the verification side, and also from the non side, the navigating side. So, first, I'd like to introduce Sonny Bob from Philips. And um, he works with Philips Consumer Lifestyle. Then we have Sarah Flack from um, who's the global head of Green, Do Green Logistics for Duncan. And Karen Ho, who's business engagement leader for uh, <coughs> Hong Kong. And finally, Charles Yuai Hoi, who's from SGS Consumer Testing Services. And you can read about their bios in the, uh, in the program, rather than me explaining it. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to um, get a discussion going about sustainability and about sourcing and to try and address some of the issues that Paul's raised in his presentation. That was great for me because he was uh, talking about some of the challenges that come in trying to do sustainable sourcing. Questions such as premiums, things like that. Um, does that make it too difficult to do? And as a moderator, I'll start by telling you about myself and then everyone else can introduce themselves. So I work for FSC, uh, Forest Stewardship Council. Um, it's been around for nearly 20 years now. Uh, we work in 100 countries around the world. And we work as a non-profit organization. So we're not about making money. We're not about doing the normal things that businesses do. We're about using the market and using supply chains and maybe using premiums to promote good forest management. So to create change in the forest. So we use the supply chains as a tool to drive environmental, social, economic change to the forest and the people who live in the forest. So in a way, we abuse the market to try and get that change to happen. So um, in, uh, around the world now, we have about 150 million hectares of FSC certified forest. Uh, 25,000 companies are certified in the supply chain to use the product label on products. So for, in about 18 years, we've become about 10% of the global trade in paper and timber products. It's actually made a big change. It's actually worked. We can say that we've all, we're working towards achieving our mission. We can demonstrate how we've actually improved forest management around the world. And we wouldn't be able to do that without uh, retailers such as Mothercare, who uh, make those decisions to try and do that procurement and make those uh, kind of bold leash steps. And that creates a demand for the, for the label, which creates a demand for the forest manager to improve what it does. So that's how we work the supply chain. So I'd like to get some discussions with these other panelists who are working in different areas of the supply chain and see how they are interacting with sustainability, whether they're doing it for their own money-making reasons or whether they're doing it for ethical reasons, and to see how we can get the discussion going so we can learn a bit more uh, and get some feedback from you as well about where we're going with this issue. So I'll start with um, uh, Sonny from Phyllis and ask you a more difficult question maybe. Um, when you're talking about Sustainability, do you see it as a, a bonus or a nice to have thing, or is it really part of the core business of your organisation? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, 
do I need to introduce myself a little bit uh, before I get to the tough question? That's uh, from, uh, from Philips um, from Singapore, so uh, not that French. Yeah? Not that um, I'm working in Hong Kong for a couple of years now. I've uh, been living in the Netherlands, and uh, that was, I must say, a very interesting country, especially Amsterdam. That's, uh, uh, but that it was a very good few years uh, working uh, in the headquarters in Philips. Uh, and, and I must say that, you know, uh, as our mission of improving people's lives through meaningful innovation. And we are working from a business perspective clearly uh, in the health and well-being context, including sustainability. It is an integral part uh, of our business. Are we there yet consistently? No. It is a journey uh, for all of us. So, so for, from my perspective, then, uh, um, that is the, uh, the status uh, of those. And do you pay more for sustainable products? Yes, we have to. Uh, if you are uh, here for early on, um, probably also in the morning, uh, we're still in a transition uh, at this stage. Uh, for example, with our consumer products, consumer goods, uh, with recycling materials and so on, uh, we have to pay more. That's uh, uh, currently the case. What we try to do, yeah, uh, as we see that uh, from a business perspective, uh, it, this overall, in the end, it is a change program. It's a change program within the company. Yeah, where we also have to ensure that all the business stakeholders are aligned on the common objectives, although we have to fulfill, huh, I think, the right uh, uh, stakeholders' value, and shareholders' value in the perspective, but also with our supply base. Yeah? And uh, in, in, in that case, what we are doing, at least uh, from a purchasing procurement perspective, what we're pushing very hard with the business is looking at the integral supply chain costs. Yeah, and not, not looking at a piece part cost, because if we focus on a piece part cost, then we are not winning that battle. So we are moving much more from towards the regional sourcing perspective, yeah, from a more global sourcing perspective, where we want to have a much shorter, greener supply chain, yeah, uh, whereby perhaps in some areas we are able to indeed, uh, uh, with the right margins, uh, go for recycled materials. So that is a bit of the balance that we are driving uh, so you mentioned green supply chain, maybe I can ask Sarah now, uh, working with green logistics. To explain what green logistics means. Excuse me. Uh, I, good afternoon, I'm Sarah Flagg. I'm uh, not French either, I'm American. Uh, living in Copenhagen for the past six months where I joined Damco, which is, uh, you may or may not be familiar with Damco, we are a global logistics provider, uh, part of the AP Muller Merce Group. Um, Prior to my joining Demco, I worked for the Port of Seattle, managing the air quality and sustainability programs for the marine operations. So I come from uh, the maritime side into the logistics side. Um, for me and for what I do with green logistics, it's about helping our customers uh, maintain or um, uh, grow their supply chains in a way that removes waste. We create efficiencies and help them understand what their footprint is. Um, the way we are able to do that is through, we've developed a very comprehensive end-to-end, uh, -end, uh, methodology for end-to-end -end supply chain footprinting, which means everything that happens in our customer supply chains from uh, however far back they want to, uh, to look, from the origin of the manufacturer all the way to the consumer, can be mapped in our um, in our systems and the carbon footprint determined. We work very closely with all of our suppliers, such as um, our ocean carriers through the Clean Cargo Work Group, to have as rigorous, comprehensive, and detailed emission factors as possible. So we can even get down to your carrier, uh, your ocean carrier, and trade lane to figure out exactly what's happening. Um, but for me, it's all about removing waste and creating these efficiencies. And if you think about how much is used uh, in getting your products to market, in, in packaging and transportation, there are often the biggest places that we can have an environmental impact are removing the waste. Um, waste packaging that you have to transport and then a consumer ultimately throws out. You pay for that. Why pay for something that you don't need? Um, so by doing, but able to look at the customer's carbon footprint and help them achieve either um, op 
optimization and efficiencies in moving their goods and uh, reducing their waste is really where we focus. Okay, and do you see sustainability is mainly about carbon footprint, or do you also look at the wider aspects, such as women's rights or you know, biodiversity, or the other kind of variable elements that come into sustainability? Um, for the AP Monomers group, sustainability is defined as the broad uh, human rights, anti-corruption, environment, uh, security. So we do, as a company, look at all of these things. For green logistics, I am focused on just the, um, the carbon footprint, packaging, material, transportation, use side. So I don't, my program does not get into the workers' rights portion of it. Um, not to say that our customers aren't looking at that, and we do have programs in place to deal with that. But fortunately, that's not my area of expertise. Okay. Okay. I guess Karen next to Mr. WWF, and I quite like to understand how WWF as an NGO work with business to engage in sustainability and also on top. Yeah. <laughs> um, for those who know about WWF, we first um, are in the area of protecting endangered species. Then we found that just um, protecting endangered species like um, sharks or Chinese red dragons or spoonbill birds is um, not sufficient in the sense that we need to protect their habitat. Then, like in Hong Kong, we managed to um, uh, reserve areas, one in uh, Maipo, uh, wetland reserve, and then the other one, um, a very protected zone uh, in Saipo in Hoi Ha. And then here comes the climate change issues that are not only impacted on animals, not only impacted on species, but also on human beings. And that's why we uh, in Hong Kong set up the climate change team uh, back in 2007. Um, we have three pillars in this climate change team. Actually, we want to engage uh, 300, uh, 360 degrees Celsius in the sense that we engage public. Um, if everybody knows now, every year in end March, uh, we do have a mass campaign with the name of Earth Hour. And then um, engaging business is another key area that we focus on. Because um, business and industries are greatest um, energy consumers in the market. And if we engage the business and industries to reduce carbon footprint or to reduce energy use, that probably will solve the problem by half. Um, my, well, I used to be a corporate executive and I joined WWF back in 2008. And my first two programs, one targeted at the factories in South China. Uh, I lead a program with the name of Low Carbon Manufacturing. And this program, we aim at working with factories to measure their factories' uh, facilities' carbon footprint. Because all along, um, brands or sourcing company may ask your supply chain to disclose carbon. Um, however, at factory level, um, their knowledge level is quite low. Uh, we need to actually provide them with the tools to really uh, measure their carbon footprint. And yet, at the same time, not only measuring is enough. Um, we need to report the data as well as to validate it. Um, we also provide them a toolkit, um, a handbook, basically, to improve their energy use efficiency. Um, that's a means to help them reduce their carbon footprint. And of course, one important thing more is to help them set up a management system, a greenhouse gas management system. So um, that probably is the work uh, at WWF, engaging the business and industries to reduce carbon footprint. Have you seen a change of companies? integrating these issues into their core business, or is it more of a kind of greenwashing or marketing? <laughs> I think um, the mindset are changing throughout the years in the sense that um, people start to realize that there's risk to manage as well as opportunity to exploit. Uh, the risk, with everybody knows also fail is a limited uh, supply. Um, even if today you still manage to secure um, your energy source, yet the price is going up. So that adds to your uh, production cost and adds to all your supply chain costs. So that's one area that we really need to look at. And in a sense, uh, improving energy efficiency as well as reducing um, the carbon emissions means that um, you actually save a lot of energy costs. And 
that will go back to your own line. So many risks is one area. Opportunity to explore is many, many, uh, like um, um, CSR issues, um, sustainability issues, and more important, consumers are getting more knowledgeable about the, the issues, and they want to buy really eco products, and they will put their support to brands or software company that uh, really engage the supply chain to provide a great, real green, green, Indian green product. So, I'll be interested to ask you more about how you check that. Maybe I'll ask SGS first. <laughs> it's their job. So, how do you check that the product is sustainable? Thank you. Uh, we talked, I'm going to introduce myself. Please introduce we, talk, we talked a lot about diversity, so I'm, I'm the Chinese guy speaking English with a French accent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I'm Charles. I, I've got two different hats, and that's why I've got such a long. Uh, position title. I'm in charge of what we call our strategic global accounts, so in terms of key account management, I'm, I'm dealing with our, our to make a long story short, top 40 or top 50 uh, customers worldwide, and I'm also in charge of global sustainability services for, for us just. Uh, how do we control that the products are, are, are sustainable? I mean, there's no, at, at the time, there's no similar definition of what should be a sustainable uh, product. Uh, what, I, what I told our customers is that it's a step-by-step -step, uh, commitment. And, and you get to find a way, you, you get to find your starting point in your, in your policy. So I think that uh, 10 or 15 years ago, we started with the social compliance. And I think that now most of the companies are using uh, social compliance as a kind of must. Uh, I remember for FSC certification, it's, it's, it's not that it's not that old. I remember like ten years, ten years ago when we were talking about FSC certification, everybody was telling me, but it is impossible. We cannot find the wood, and it's, it's impossible to trace uh, uh, the, the wood and so on. And then step by step, you know, a lot of companies moved to that, of course, pushed by by the big international groups. But that's the proof that we can improve the things and put the things in place. Uh, step by step. There are, not, there, are, there are still a lot, not enough probably, but there are still a lot of regulation. The question is whether uh, the, 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 the companies, the factories, you know, uh, really, really follow the rules in place. If you look, if you look at China, there are, there are labor laws in place, uh, there are environmental laws in place. So I would say that as a starting point, if the, 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 the factories, the suppliers, the manufacturers who are following the local regulation, that would be a very, very nice starting point. So what, what SJS is doing now is that I mean, most of you know that we are, we are supporting you in, in the quality control process and from the raw materials until the shelves. So what I tell my clients is that maybe SJS can help and we're not talking only about verification control, we're talking about providing solutions to improve uh, the, the, the sustainability of your supply chain. Because I think it's a, it's a great opportunity because we're not talking about legal things, we are still talking about a lot of voluntary programs, and that's where SGS can bring the knowledge uh, uh, to to customers or to NGOs like FSC or WWW. So this is really uh, where, where, where we can help is our knowledge of the supply chain, our knowledge of the products and, and, and the manufacturing process, and our global network and position. Uh, if you need to implement a, a, a CSR, so-called CSR uh, strategy or policy worldwide, then we can certainly help. This is the major countries where, where you are sourcing now. So in, in China, we, we have about 2,000 companies with FC China posted supply chain certificates. And that's just about half of that market. So I'm interested to know how you talk about, you know, legal, there's always laws in place and people comply with the laws. How, how, how are you seeing a change in that compliance? Is the, the compliance getting stronger? Are companies still faking, faking documentation? Is that improving? Um, and what should companies be doing to uh, check that things are really being complied with? 
Yeah, I have to say that, that the manufacturers uh, find find the tricks to try to override uh, the, the buyer's requirements. In the meantime, I think that the audio skills uh, are improving as well, and, and there are there are more communication. And, and I think that, that when we start, I was very interested to 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 hear about partnership. You know? I think that this is really crucial because we are keeping on talking about partnerships and partnerships and partnerships. But at the end of the day, you know, there's still a, a, a relationship which is between your know, strengths and, 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 and purchasing power. If you really want to be successful in your so-called sustainability part, then you really need to you know, think about uh, the, the partnership uh, uh, discussion with, with your, your suppliers. Because it's going to take time. As I said, it's a step-by-step. You cannot, you cannot ask from scratch to your suppliers you know, to be you know, suddenly sustainable. There's a learning process, and they are not all at the same level. You will have some very high-level factories you know, on, on technology, you know, technology, social, uh, 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 environmental program already in place, ISO certification, whatever, and some very small factories restarting from scratch. That doesn't mean that they don't want to improve. If you don't give them the chance to do that, then nothing will happen, or the threat will be so high that they will try to find tricks and, and have kind of uh, double payables, more certificates, and so on. That's, that's how the rule, uh, uh, that's how the game is, is, is going on now. But when there's a, a, a willingness of transparency, then we can see some very interesting programs going on, and, and we are probably some of those pilot projects and, and very, very good results, not only in terms of environmental or social uh, compliance, but also in terms of money saving and cost cutting. And of course, this, this cost saving, then you will have to share between uh, uh, the vendors, the manufacturers, and between the buyers, and that's the best win-win situation. So a sustainable product may not be always more expensive. I was telling one, one of the, 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 the person here this morning, I often encourage uh, uh, the, our, our customers when they manage to get some, some those, those very significant savings, not to try to get another premium on the price of that product, because that, that's where we start to talk about green washing and, 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 and so on, and that's where we, we just break down the, 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 the trust with the consumer because they have the, 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 the feeling that they pay twice the price. And that's the big mistake. I think that when you manage to get some very nice saving on environmental issues, then this should benefit to all the, the, the stakeholders. And that's where we're going to move to the so-called sustainable economy and sustainable business. Maybe I can follow up on that with Sonia. When you work with supplies, um, how do you encourage that compliance? You know, do you give them credits for environmental issues or do you just focus on price and quality? How do you really engage them? As I said earlier, there's a journey and um, also Charles was saying that it is an evolving idea. Uh, I'm also responsible globally for the uh, supply sustainability program at first level. Uh, and what we have done with the program is actually moving from a much more push model to a pull model where we would like the suppliers to be you know, uh, empowered to drive sustainability and not just the requirements from the brands. I think that's the change. Yeah? Uh, it is also the mindset change that we have to drive that. Um, Charles, as you mentioned, you know, uh, supporting them, driving and working with them, for example, for lean operations, for example, uh, finding efficiencies there uh, and then to, to, to work on other things. I think these are the you know, the, the carrots uh, that we also can pop up as, as, as a brand. We are also very strict uh, if we indeed find non compliances, yeah, clear warning, uh, and we have also seen in the last couple of years clearly uh, uh, moving up uh, changing suppliers in, in suppliers yeah, uh, due to non compliance. So we also take that very strict to also send the right message. There, yeah. um, but it's also, you know, talk about partnership, but partnership means that it, you need both sides to work together. Yeah. Uh, we also see different maturity of our supply base. There are suppliers that you know, just have the wrong concept at this stage. Yeah. 
and need to educate them. Yeah? And there are others who are much more mature, working with multiple uh, uh, global brands, uh, and then those are the right partners uh, to work with. How do you convince customers to? Now, what's your short value proposition for going green? It's not shy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, actually, it's uh, often the customers coming to us. Um, when we um, when we talk with customers, they always want to know what are you doing with green. They don't always want to do a project with us, but they want to know what we can do with them. A lot of um, tenders that we get, um, requests for us to give them proposals on, on services that we could do, they all require some kind of environmental documentation. Either do you have a sustainability plan, what do you do for your own carbon footprint, um, it depends on the company, but I find I very rarely have to introduce the topic. Um, and so that's kind of cool. It's I think two things are happening. One is consumers are more aware, especially in Europe and uh, North America and growing in Asia. They want to know what the footprint of the, the Starbucks cup that they're buying. I say Starbucks even though I'm in Seattle, right? So I got to go for the whole time. But they want to know what the footprint of that is. They want to know what their impact is. And so they're pushing their companies that they buy from. But regulations are increasing especially in the global transportation level, the International Maritime Organization and um, the EU are both pushing for carbon regulations on ships and airplanes. All that means is that the cost of transportation is going to go up because that carbon is now going to be accounted for in a monetary way. So the companies are seeing their costs are going to go up for transportation. The consumers are asking, for more sustainable products, nobody wants to pay more for anything. So how do you work together to create these, these um, ways of creating an environmental benefit, an economic benefit, give the consumers what they want, have good business. Um, so I, I never have to introduce the topic. It's pretty cool. Yeah. From a FC point of view, we now have we do some consumer surveys. And in Hong Kong, we've now got 29% consumer awareness of the FSC label. It's doubled in the last year or so. And that's been quite surprising to me how it's grown so quickly. Uh, I don't take the credit for that. But I think a lot of that comes from the work that companies do, but also from organizations like NGOs like WWF and the promotion they do. So how, how will WWF engage with consumers to try and encourage them to demand sustainable products? What's your kind of strategy on that? Well, um, we engage consumers from um, two ways. The first one is basically uh, consumer education. Um, we have an education team um, engaging schools from primary to secondary and up to university, um, talking about different uh, conservation issues. And then the second one is um, to really um, put up the issues um, for public debate, um, like a lot of um, uh, Recently, um, Hong Kong issues like um, whether you should landfill your waste, uh, whether you should use a country parks to to uh, for for waste uh, incineration and and that sort of things. Um, that's uh, well, I would say that's challenging issues because uh, there's no absolute yes or no right or wrong answer. It's just that you need to find out the right solution at the right time and at the right place. Um, so there's a kind of um, engaging the public to really understand the issues, debate, and find out the solutions. And the charge you see is the, the consumers that are driving this debate, or is it more companies that are the ones who are driving, not, who are telling the consumers what they want? Uh, for the time being, I would say yes, the companies have to drive the change. Uh, I mean, that's absolutely right. Uh, Four or five years ago, there was a very strong demand, and now we are, we are still in the third world. So it's, it's very challenging for the consumers. But anyway, I think that there's, a, there's still a very strong recognition of the so-called sustainable companies when the message is consistent and when there's a, a long story behind. I mean, uh, when we talked about body shop, I mean, this is something, even though you don't go to body shop to buy this because the product is like ethical or whatever. You know, you've got a good 
know, images will often miss and then you'll be comfortable to buy. And I think this is very important. I used to work, I mean, I, I'm now a service provider, but I was on the old bank of the river. I used to work for a, a big retail a company, a, a sustainability head. And, and my company at that time I had a very strong green image for some reasons. I mean, and, and it was far from being perfect, but at least whatever we decided to do, then we would do it you know, deeply and, 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 and aggressively. And, and the people still got this image. You know, and when they go and they buy and you, you start a new initiative on, on, on sustainability, then they will trust you. I think Philips has this image as well, you know, innovation as well. No, but I mean, it's not because you're, uh, yes, it's because you're on stage. Like, I think it was an example, but that's true. I mean, this, there, there is this image of innovation as well that lasts forever. So it, it, it really helps. If you got consistency, in, in, your, in your sustainable policy then it will sooner or later be profitable. Really, I, I, I strongly feel that. If you just go back and forth, you know, you, you try something and then you just, just step back, then you, you, will, you will be probably suspected of, of greenwashing very soon. And then you will have to face some, some NGOs. Yeah. Our consumers association back in Germany, we talk about the German market. Consumers Association are, 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 are very, very powerful. And it's a big issue if you, if you go with the greenwashing uh, marketing message there. So, Mr. Phillips, do you think that, that is a question of good marketing and good advertising? Or is it um, you have to really invest in the supply chain to really make it sustainable before you can get that consumer perception? Or is it just a question of more of having a very good marketing team and a very good advertising team? The marketing campaigns that we do um, with Philips, uh, it is really about putting the consumer uh, at the heart of what we do. Uh, and uh, we need consumer propositions, uh, right propositions uh, for the consumer, or in our healthcare uh, area, for example, uh, which is much more patient focused, okay? uh, or in our lighting uh, business, yeah? uh, where we can focus on sustainability, focusing on energy efficiency, for example. So I think uh, there, it, it is part of the <coughs> Maybe it's not DNA, but it is part of really what we would like to do uh, as part of life. Uh, it is not, for example, focusing on campaign on just green products, uh, but having uh, green sustainability be a part of it. And I think uh, a, a third of our business comes from lighting, and with the whole energy efficiency, energy savings area, uh, is a very, very nice focus uh, for our lighting business. In the consumer business too, when we talk about uh, again uh, energy efficiency, consumer products, for example, in consumer electronic uh, areas and goods and so on, again we have the right uh, focus there. Yeah? Uh, but there are some consumer, uh, you know, uh, behavior uh, that also needs to evolve. For example, uh, we for the last couple of years in our floor care uh, products focus a lot on energy efficiency. It is not selling. Consumer one, you know, high power, high power, you know. Big suction power. So, so there, there is, you know, that challenge. Yeah. So there, there has to be right propositions for that niche, and also additional proposition. You cannot focus just on the green product. But that does not sell by itself. Huh? We have done. Thank you. Well, we've got a lot of people here. We've got a lot more experience in this than I have. So, can we get some questions from the floor to the, the panel? Anybody have a question? Anybody? I have a very selfish question to Sarah uh, relating to the quality of air in Hong Kong. Is there anything we can do as shippers to make sure that our goods are not carried by dirty trucks and are not carried on uh, dirty bunker fuel uh, ships in uh, Hong Kong waters? Do you, do, any, do you have any programs for name and shame or uh, helping people to choose the right channel? <laughs> Uh, uh, I feel a little bit like I'm back at the port of Seattle there for a second. Um, you know, the, I know that what has been happening in terms of regulations in Hong Kong around shipping has been on a voluntary scale, the Hong Kong Civic Exchange, um, which there's a fabulous woman there, Veronica Boot, who's been working. I know Veronica quite well. She's been working very hard to um, 
to get the government's charter extended, to get more funding for it, and you know, there's been great success with it so far. I had a similar program at the Port of Seattle at, at the time. The trick is that it's very expensive to make these changes. Um, the, the cost of changing the, the bunker fuel in the ships to these cleaner ones is sometimes two, three times more expensive. Um, so the subsidy that you have to, or the, the incentive that you have to give to the shipping lines is sometimes unsustainable for the budget that you have. Um, the International Maritime Organization has the ability for countries to go forward and, and ask for um, an emission control area in their waters. There are three in existence now, North Sea, Baltic Sea, and now North America coming in August. Um, China, the political will to do that, I don't believe is there right now. So, you know, I'm not an expert in China politics by any means, but um, it took more. Than, it took the United States and Canada quite some time to do it. Uh, really, I think the, the place that you can be most successful in Hong Kong is to continue to work in these public-private partnerships and continue to talk amongst each other. Um, about the importance of it and keep it in the forefront. Um, it, it takes a lot of, you know, it, it's, it's there, everybody knows of it, but it starts to fade away into the background a little bit unless people, you know, the suppliers are saying, we want you to be part of the Fairwinds Charter. If we're going to carry you on your ship, we want you to do these things. Because the, the shipping lines start to say, well, it's really expensive, we want the country to go to IMO and make this a regulation so all the shipping lines have to do it. It's a very tricky thing to do. Um, so I don't have a, a good answer for you unless you know start lobbying to get an emission control area in place. Um, I have one uh, participant uh, participating factories in my program that uh, really address the issues. Um, in a different way. Um, they, the factories are located along the Pearl River Delta, and then uh, Pearl River, um, and then they have uh, their own river port, and they, when we engage them to do a low carbon manufacturing program, um, we educate the employee that um, all the emission areas, all the emission sources within their factory base, um, that they can identify and they can brainstorm solutions to it, uh, brainstorm ideas to reduce all the emissions. And one of the ideas came from the employees are uh, that uh, instead of trucking all their goods by lorry down to Hong Kong and then ship it through the ports, they decided that it's a better way to um, build their own wealth for temporary storage, and then they keep all the goods all together, and then they ship it by inner uh, water boat. And they actually calculate the emissions um, by such doing is much, much lower than trucking it by lorry on a daily basis. So there's a lot of um, ideas from the employee crew, I'd say, and because uh, they are the one who's in charge of their day-to-day -day business. And if you put the issues right in front of them, um, they understand the issues, they understand the objective, and then they are very much uh, into it and a very strong solution for it. So that's one example from, from the factory. Are you going to work with the government to try and get the regulations more strict? Um, well, in South China, there's already um, a lot of energy efficiency uh, regulations, and city by city, province by province. And then um, there's also a China production partnership program launched both in Hong Kong as well as in South China. So uh, we basically work hand in hand with this kind of uh, initiatives because we believe uh, tackling both air pollution as well as climate change can be at tandem. Okay, I think there were a few hands. Oh, yeah, sorry, a few hands. I'll just go over here, Valerie. Oh, you got him. Yes, yes, I did. Uh, Valerie Gustav from King Fisher. I think it's a question for Easter. And we talk about 150 million uh, hectares of uh, certified forest. 
uh, with the physics of issue, with certain materials such as MDF or sort of certain timbers. What's the plan for the next five years or next ten years? Um, is what we want because that drives the market. So it's great that there's demand for NDF. Um, but we're working with Kingfisher, actually, we're working with some of the colleagues, uh, particularly in China, where all the NDF comes from, to try and find uh, suppliers of NDF to work with local forest owners to form group schemes to get the NDF cheaper. Because the moment the problem with NDF for certification is that NDF is so cheap to buy because uh, the the raw material is usually waste material or off-road off materials, um, but it, the margins are so small that to go for an entity certification is quite expensive. So we're looking at ways to make that certification cheaper for NDF. Uh, so I see that getting cheaper, and, and some of your um, colleagues are working with particular suppliers and partnering with those suppliers, and with those developers in China, uh, to try and make those group schemes happen so that that certification can be done in a cheap way so that you can get the, the NDF at a better cost to it. Thanks. That's enough. Thanks. Okay. Alistair, I think the other interesting point is we, we talked earlier on about that you know, FSC compliance in China. And, and you talked about 2,000 companies now that are compliant. But I think that's quite an interesting, there's some interesting numbers here because if I'm not mistaken, when you set up, let's say, 18 months ago, that was a, a, a far lesser number. Well, um, when I got to China, it was 2006 and it was less than 200. Less than 200. Yeah. So that, that's quite a, a success story. I mean, I can be quite cynical about sustainability and, of course, uh, there's a lot of lip service paid yeah. to sustainability, but in that case, well, that is one of the success stories. Yeah, it's been very successful in, in the market. That's been driven by European, North American, and Japanese resellers and procurement. If they're looking to source, because they're buying everything else from China, then they demand their suppliers to certify. So do those suppliers get it? Though? I mean, they've got pressure from the overseas buyers, but do they see the merits? Yeah, yeah, because they, they, they don't get market access otherwise. So it's a market decision. Okay, great. We have another question over here, and I'll come back to you. Right. I was listening from the beginning from the monarchy as well, the sustainability, whether you can have actually have you know, made enough margin up. So we're talking about very you know, small margin coming from consumer markets and some other brands that are here from like MS and body, body shops and so on. But why not we discuss, I mean, discuss about those companies and brands who can afford this margin, like for example, like high-end brands. So this question to maybe, maybe to Crystal, because I, Crystal is the only one I know in here, maybe uh, covering from high-end market, is an uh, industry like yours, uh, thinking about it, I mean, are you in line with it? <laughs> what is your strategy now? Let me show up because it's your, it's your so, no, I guess, friends. I guess I know it's, it's, a, it's a tough one. Um, I think regardless of the industry at the end, wherever the margin is set, you need that margin. And if you have a high margin, your market expects you to keep a high margin. So I think it's, it's not so much dependent on the industry, it's really dependent on, on the, uh, on the, on the con consumer. And when our consumer will ask us to not use PVC anymore and use only FSC paper, etc., etc., uh, we'll be the first one to go there because we can't afford to lose one single consumer. Um, but but yeah, can. Well, maybe I can a couple, but um, no. But the point is really driven. Yeah, I mean, I think we are all getting to the same to the same point. Is is we need to get the consumer um, to to I mean to get to, to, to ask for it. And, and at this point, uh, I, I concur with the other participants. Is we don't feel that so much. The, the, the crux of the matter is not just consumers asking for it, but is it consumers willing to pay for it? I mean, that there's a cost attached, isn't there? For FSC, as Paul mentioned, for some things there aren't a cost. So for office paper now, it's the same cost. So there's now a choice you can make between FSC and non FSC. Uh, for paper and packaging, where the costs are non existent, so you have access. But for some products, such as tropical harbors, there is a cost. But that, that's reflected in the, what the forest manager has to do to improve their work. So it costs them more to harvest the materials. So sometimes you, that margin is needed to be able to fund 
the changes that need to happen in the forest from a, from a forest point of view. In other aspects of sustainability, it's slightly different. Sometimes you have a sense of something done, but it, from our point of view, sometimes those margins are a good thing because that cost somehow needs to feed down to fund the changes that need to happen in the forest. I think Paul made a good point where he was talking about the water use paint and that the the changing of the paint um, was more expensive, but you saved money um, in later on in your manufacturing process. So not everything is a net increase in cost. Um, sometimes you will pay more on one side to save money on the other, and sometimes your costs will totally go down. It really depends on what business you're in and what you're looking at. There's a lot of places still that you can just eliminate waste and save a lot of money. Yeah, and, and as, as we heard before, innovation yes. can help to, to save some of those costs. I guess I'm going to... Yeah, Paul, you want to say something? Well, I, we've heard a lot of examples today, but I'm personally a little bit frustrated. Most of the examples that we heard are very incremental, but also small decisions made by people that are passionate about this uh, sustainability issue. But it seems to me that most of those decisions are very incremental. The change are not really big. I would like to go back to FSC. My understanding of FSC and that label you created has had a big impact into at least the way people think. So what is a driver? Is it the government? Is it retailers? Is it consumers? Because the first thing is we get away to the consumers. I don't like that answer, I'm sorry. What I want to hear is what can we do as people to just really make a big leap in sustainability. Uh, Paul mentioned the air pollution in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is just one example. I think air pollution is a serious problem across the world. So what can we do to have this same idea or concept as, as FSC in air pollution? Why can't we come, with, uh, come up with the same solution? I think, look, let's uh, give some kind of a label to the carriers. Those guys are the good guys that are green. And the big retailers that are here today, they must be able to start up and say, we want to work with those guys. So the market will drive that instead of just incremental things. I think um, to answer that in two ways. Um, retailers have originally been a real big really driver of efficacy over the years. But more and more now we're seeing governments being uh, an important driver. With public procurement in particular, so government procurement policies, in terms of construction, uh, that could be between 20 and 70 or 80 percent of, of the wood that's used in construction in, in a country. So what the government does in terms of procurement policies can have a big difference. And also we're seeing in construction also green building schemes such as LEED. Uh, in Hong Kong we have HKB, both of them which are specifying FSC as, as the way to go. So that's been a very big driver, uh, particularly in China, for say plywood or um, window frames or doors. That's not been driven by retailers, that's been driven by policy from green building from governments. So with, uh, with other schemes there is a role for government to play. We're a non-governmental organization, but we work with governments. So I think it's a balance. You can have those two things working together. Uh, I would say, from my point of view, I've seen the most innovation and, and biggest changes coming out of industry. Um, if you're not familiar with the Clean Cargo Work Group, it's a business-to-business -business collaboration that's ocean carriers, retailers, and logistics companies that have come together specifically to address environmental issues from this portion of our, um, our lives. And the biggest thing that we've had to deal with in clean cargo is just a common understanding of what the impacts are and how to measure it. So that's been one of the biggest challenges is globally there are no, there's no alignment for how you measure these kinds of things and, and we're working on that through clean cargo. Um, but I have been impressed, having come from working in a government agency, which is the Port Authority was a government agency, just how much innovation and um, commitment that companies can have. And when they do decide to do something and, and they have a full commitment from top management on <coughs> how quickly they can do it. Um, but it's hard. You have to have, as Paul said earlier, you have to have the right people. And you also have to have the right economic conditions. The, the economic conditions of the past few years have really, I think, worn on everybody and that's caused a lot of things. Um, and oftentimes the regulations that are enacted don't, 
they don't reach out to their industry stakeholders in a very meaningful way, and so you end up with regulations that don't achieve as much as could have been done if the companies were allowed to innovate, and it ends up being a lot more costly. But it's hard, I'm with you. It's sometimes, I ask myself what I'm doing every day, and how I can make it better, and be more passionate about it, and reach the right people. Next, we have a, we have a question. Yeah, hi, Dick Casey from Sustainable Sourcing. I think um, there's two things that will drive this. It'll be um, Chinese environmental policy on the factories. Um, that will stop a lot of pollution. And then carbon footprint labels for retailers. And when that legislation is brought in, it will drive that forward and improve the environment. But I'd like to ask the panel, how long are we away from this? How many years? You, you know that there's a project of environmental labeling in France, you know, that they start... Yes, but it has to be a global European label and a US label. Yeah. How long are we away, do you think, in you? You're right. I think, I think it's, it, it will be at least five to six years down the road. It will not happen before. But I'm not saying that, again, as, as I said, yeah, of course we can rely on the governments you know, to enforce things and so on. But the big changes, I mean, we all know this here, is going to come from the corporate world. It's going to come from the business leaders, uh, 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 definitely. I mean, I, I, I think that we underestimate the changes. Again, if we take the example of FSC, you know, I think that within a few years, most of the major European retailers just say, okay, we stop legal wood. And then, of course, they, they move to FSC, and for FSC, it's a big challenge because it takes years before you take a forest, you know, from, uh, I guess the people working in this business, in this industry knows that it takes 10 to something years before you have a sustainable forest. So they need time, but at least the, 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 the market is there. And now it becomes a must. So you, you could say, ah, it's, no, it's not sustainable anymore, it's just a standard. I would strongly disagree. I think it's a big change. If you look at the textile industry regarding hazardous substances in the product, most, most of the progress were made thanks to the, 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 the policy of the big textile manufacturers or retailers, and there was nothing mandatory on that. But they had their, their restricted substance list, and they started to have more and more requirements. Now we are coming to the final end with the Greenpeace campaign, where some very famous brands, you know, had, had the, the commitment to totally, totally uh, 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 eliminate their, their, their discharge uh, of hazardous substances. I can tell you that this is going to drive the industry, because what that you can the leaders doing that, then it would be very challenging for the others not to follow. So we cannot always rely on the government. I think that all all here we have, and we should have a personal commitment. And it can be linked to, to the, sus the sustainability policy of your company. Because sometimes the people compare that to quality, you know, or compliance like 20 years ago. And I say, you know, it's very different. Because when we talk, 20 years ago when we were talking about quality, it was very difficult for any employee to find his own benefit into that. I think that with sustainability, everybody can see it. Can, can think about its own, its own benefit or benefit for its children or whatever you, you like, but you can feel that. You can, you can do something. You can switch off your life. You can, you can reduce the use of planes, of cars, or whatever. You can really do, you can really do something with that. Quality, yes, it was important, but at the end of the day, it was only a company's benefit. Now, with sustainability, you have a very strong driver. We are talking about human resources. I mean, this is proven. If your company has a strong sustainability policy, this is an, uh, uh, an attractive uh, topic for, for the young talents. This is definitely a, a I mean, there are, there are HR, HR experts there. I think that, that they will confirm that this is something very important for the image of your company. Gen Y. Those are the drivers. Gen Y is, is playing a, a far greater role. The younger generation yes. is playing a far greater role. Paul? Question from you, sir. Just no, adding a, a plug in for the chamber. I, I agree with you. It's it's a, it's a major issue, and it's it's our own issue. We all have to do it at, at, at our own level. 
As far as the chamber is concerned, it's an issue which we've been fighting for for many years. We've been lobbying the government here uh, actively uh, at every level, uh, together with uh, Christine Law, with all the, all the actors in, in the environment uh, field. Um, and we have a very uh, dynamic uh, uh, sustainable committee. We changed the name because sustainable committee was not very sexy, so now we call it Green Business Committee, and it's very active. So if you, some of you are, are concerned by those issues, please join the, the Green Business Committee and uh, join our efforts. Right now, we are preparing a paper for the new chief executive elect. Uh, we're going to meet him soon. Uh, and, and this is one of the issues we stress every year in our, in our yearly uh, policy address issues to the, to the CE and also to the financial secretary. Unfortunately, in the last five years, we've been very disappointed every year uh, when we hear the budget, there's nothing about the environment, virtually nothing. So we hope that with the new CE and with all the efforts of, uh, of our chamber, of AMCHAM and of all the other actors, we'll finally get somewhere. Okay, thanks for that sir. note. The Green Business Unit, ladies and gentlemen, go and have a chat with Paul later on. I think we've got time for perhaps one final question. Come over here. Thanks. Uh, Luke Peach from Aldi. Just wanted to ask the panel if they thought um, uh, retailers uh, and other big industries uh, pushing hard for sustainability um, will mean that the supply chain can cope with uh, meeting that requirement. In terms of uh, paper and cost, and uh, timber, um, if that demand is greater, then the supply will come. It might take some time, and it might be more expensive to start with, but no, the supply chain has changed now, so that particularly in paper and packaging, you can now get FSC everything, in China or wherever you want. So that's changed. That's been a change in the last three or four years. And that reached, reached a critical mass with large forests being certified in Canada, Russia, and Brazil. Um, in terms of tropical harbors, the supply chain is going to be hard, because it's harder to get that stuff sustainable. Uh, but the demand is what's actually making a change in the forest. So there is more and more tropical harbour getting certified, which is saving the rain, you know, it's protecting the rain and habitat. So that demand that you're creating um, is actually having an impact on the environment. Well, in other sectors, maybe other people could talk. Yeah, I guess really just to wrap up, I'd be very interested in your views in terms of are we on the right track with regards to sustainability? Because I go back to Sonny's comment right at the beginning, and you asked a very pertinent question. You said, are we there yet? And, and you're, you, know, you said, are we there yet? And then you followed on and saying, no, we're not there. It's actually a long journey. So any other views, final wrap-up views? Sarah? I don't know. I think we still have a long way to go. Even some of the most advanced companies, in terms of their sustainability policies, are still understanding what their impacts are and learning how internally what it means to them and how they can um, deal with their suppliers and their transportation. Um, it's, it's, I'll be employed for quite some time. <laughs> Sonny, how about your role at Philips as the global sustainability supplier? I believe we're on the right track. Yeah? We're on the right track. Uh, and the engagement model um, is, um, is I think, getting the right results. Um, also, we are now together, I think uh, Ian, you see, I think Ian was joining the earlier uh, panel discussion, where together with Flatline Brands together, uh, uh, we are coming together with Dow and uh, HP, as the three founding brands together with NGOs, together with the Chinese government, uh, to drive also uh, the improvement uh, working conditions uh, of the workers in the Pearl River Delta. So things like that, we are putting things together. So, so uh, Foxconn, your members do? Yeah, <laughs> not part of that yet. <laughs> but they have a different challenge. So, um, but we are coming together indeed, uh, realizing that <coughs> efforts just on the brands alone, we, we can't make it work uh, with the suppliers. So we are coming together, working with the suppliers uh, to enable the improvement. So I think that's the right track for us. For us. Yeah. And, and do you feel the suppliers are getting it? Are they getting the message? More and more. More and more. Okay. Karen? Um, hi. I will ask the business leader in this room um, to really think out of the box. 
I hear so much uh, questions and answers just now, and then uh, we are still talking about economic values, economic costs along the supply chains. Um, but what happened here is really there are um, social costs as well as environmental costs. If you put these two causes uh, into the equations, and then if you can innovate solutions and talk to the government or to line up with the st all the stakeholders, I'm pretty confident that we can find solutions. Okay, great message. Everybody, think out of the box. Charles? Yeah, I agree. I mean, we, we, we better get out of our comfort zone if we want to be successful with, with sustainability. I think, I think it is important. Again, don't uh, underestimate the, the cost savings that you can find there, you know, of course, especially on the environmental side. And I would say, you know, I'm, I'm surprised because uh, we say that we are not there, that, that, that the companies don't do anything. I, I'm involved into a lot of projects, including with a lot of companies sitting there today in the meeting room. But something that I don't understand is why those companies are sometimes so low profile with what they are doing. And we talked about sharing you know, experience, we talked about doing partnerships and so on. There are, there are huge, huge you know, opportunities to do interesting things. So, so I would say, I, I just take the opportunity to say, you're not the only one working on the, on the topic. Of course, I cannot you know, release the information. But there are a lot of initiatives, including in, in this room. So, we, we are definitely on the right track. Yes, it's going to take time. Yes, we have to, to cross our fingers that the economy will recover. But that would be part, I think that the sustainability part would be, would be one of the solutions to recover from, from the world. As Paul White mentioned in his presentation, we have got to share and collaborate. That's very important. the final comments to wrap up? Seeing evidence from my example, when we started in 1993, we were just seeing this crazy idea. It came out of the UN conference on sustainability in 1992. Governments didn't agree on what to do about forests. They couldn't get an agreement. So a group of people got together, from NGOs, from business, uh, from social groups, indigenous people's groups, said, well, what can we do? You know, they created a tool, a voluntary certification tool. It wasn't the only thing that could fix this, but it's a tool. And, and the only reason it's been so successful is because some companies, and one particular example is Kingfisher, who were here, committed very early on, like back in 1995, 96, to say, this is something that we can use to make a difference. And those companies show leadership. And that really made a change. And now that's changed an entire industry. There's now an industry that sees sustainability, sees social groups, sees NGOs as part of their core business. They, they deal with those people every day. So that's changed. Where, the way industry works. I think there's other models, certification is just one tool, but there's other models to engage with different groups uh, to try and make fundamental change to how businesses can work. Okay. On that note, I'd like to uh, ask you all to join me in thanking our esteemed panel. <laughs> Um, I think great insights there. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think just a couple of quick notes as well. We're now going to go into a coffee break. Um, we're going to break for 25 minutes, but I really need you to be back here because we've got another very fascinating keynote speaker. His name is Ben Simpendorfer, former chief economist at RBS, chief economist over at JP Morgan in his day. Um, got some great insights. Um, also authored some very interesting publications, and in fact, a, a recent book entitled The Silk Road, or The New Silk Road. Um, that's going to be a great session, and our final wrap-up panel for the day on some of those financial best practices. You don't want to miss those. So, enjoy your coffee and croissants. We'll see you back here very soon.